Uh, welcome everyone to the panel 7B. Uh, this panel title is Indigenous Taiwan. Uh, I'm Liu Junyu, the chair of this panel. Uh, I'm an archaeologist, but uh, some kind of related to uh, Taiwan indig indigenous, indigenous culture uh, research here. So I will be the chair today. <laughs> we have three presenters today. <laughs> And uh, the topic of today's uh, presenter's work is quite range in the old spectrum from music to uh, politics and uh, to, well, genetic study and cross related to uh, sociology. So uh, uh, we will have uh, Chen Junbin from School of Music, Taipei National University of Arts first and then follow up uh, with S Scott Simon from the Department of Sociology, University of Ottawa. And then finally will be uh, Cai Youyue from Institute of uh, Sociology, Academia Sinica. So let's welcome our first presenter. Uh, one last announcement because we have only three presenters today. So we will have 20 minutes for each presenter. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, this paper performing in uh, constructing an invisible boy's house through singing and dancing in a Taiwanese indigenous village presents a case study on indigenous diaspora. Considering indigenous people of the Baburu village in southeastern Taiwan as living in indigenous diasporas and adopting the concept of chronotope about connection between time and space, I discuss how performance serves as a means of a return to homelands from diasporic contexts to which I refer as performing. Taking the door to door singing event, Samimo Simu of the Baburu Village's youth group legacy at the end of every year as an example, I discuss how different elements are articulated in their performances for audience inside and outside their village thus translating the culture of their traditional boy's house into a contemporary version. Now I play you a clip of Sami Mushimu. <laughs> Uh, Baburu is one of the 10 villages that constitute the Binongyumayang group, one of Taiwan's 16 Australasian-speaking indigenous groups. Baburu village and Buyuma village is split from the, the old, uh, Baburu, old Buyuma villages in the 1930s and have been often regarded as twin villages. Um, here is and the old Puyuma is around here. Okay. The old Puyuma dominated all the Binoyuma young villages for about two centuries before Japan took over Taiwan. Puyuma villages was so mighty not only among the Binoyuma young villages, but also in Eastern Taiwan, that the term Puyuma was used as the postural total term to refer to the group that now called the Binoyuma young until this new term was proposed in recent years. Around 1930, the Japanese government relocated the Binoyuma young people from their former places of residence to the current locations. 
most of the Buyuma villages moved to the new village that is now officially called Nanwang in Mandarin. To distinguish the old Puyuma from the current Puyuma village, I use the term Puyuma to refer to the old one and call the current one Nanwang in the following discussion. Babur village was established by a group of the villagers in the old Buyuma who refused to, re to move to Nanwan village during this relocation period. They moved to a street block near the Taidong downtown area instead. Soon thereafter, the Japanese forced them to move to the Baosang area, which was once a territory of Buyuma, but was gradually occupied by Han settlers during the Qin period. Babur village has fewer than 40 indigenous families, about 200 residents. And the house of these indigenous families are surrounded by those of the Han Taiwanese. Since there is no significant difference in appearance between houses of the indigenous people and those of the Han people in this village, when entering Baburu village for the first time, an outsider would be unlikely to notice that it is an indigenous village. The Binongyo Mayan people of the Baburu village have been struggling to establish identity since the village was established. They strive to maintain their cultural characteristics to distinguish themselves from the Han majority around them and to obtain recognition from other Binuyumayang villages for the status of the full member of the Binuyumayang group. They persist in conducting traditional rituals, especially the Mangayao ritual, that is the great hunting ritual, to maintain their age-set system and to promote solidarity among village members. The main reason that Baburu villagers persist in conducting the Mangayao ritual is that this ritual manifests the values, meaning, and judgments associated with the Binuyumayang age set system, the fundamental basis of the Binuyumayang social structure. In matrilineal Binuyumayang society, males are not born to be Binuyumayang, but rather they become Binuyumayang by completing training in the men's house and boys' house. Only after they complete age set training and are recognized as members of the men's house can they be accepted as true Binuyumayang qualifying for marriage, starting a family, and participation in village affairs. An adolescent completing Binuyumayang character education and training in hunting and fighting at the boy's house requests a male elder to act as his mentor and then become an intern of the men's house. After participating in three consecutive years of the Mangaya, he becomes a full member of the men's house. Both the men's house and the boy's house are important components of the Binuyuma Yang age set system. This picture shows the building of the, Puyum, the Baburu men's house. The annual Mangaya takes place at the squared adjacent to the men's house. Um, this picture shows the building of the Nanwan boys' house. Members of the boys' house observed the bus bus, the monkey killing ceremony and its prelude event, the Alabagai, in which boys visit families door to door in the village and shout Alabagaita to repair misfortune when entering each house. Baburu village does not observe the Basibas and the Alabagai because this village has not built a boy's house since its establishment. 
Nonetheless, a youth performing group legacy was established in 1998 as the substitute of the Boys House and the door to door singing event Sami Mosimu invented in 2004 has become an annual event of legacy and Baburu village. Is there a specific co-indigenous kind of diasporism? James Clifford raised this question in his book, Returns, Becoming Indigenous in 21st Century. We usually consider that indigenism and diasporism contradict each other. On one hand, the diaspora refers to exiled migration, displacement, travel, the circulation, cosmo cosmopolitanism, distance, loss, nostalgia, and the expectation of a returning home. On the other hand, indigeneity implies something primordial, past landedness, autochthony, localism and cultural racial essence. However, Clifford notes that indigenous peoples around the world have similar experiences of the moving away from homelands due to settler encroachment, military pressure, and epidemiological dis disasters so that, quote, unquote, as public ruptures and connections are fundamental components of the indigenous experience today. Clifford summarizes the features of diaspora suggested by William Safran as follows, quote, a history of dispersal, myths, memories of the homeland, alienation in the host or bad host country, desire for eventual return, ongoing support of the homeland and a collective identity importantly defined by this relationship, end quote. Based on Seferent and Clifford's observation, I argue that what really defines a diasporic group in diaspora discourse is not what time and to what place those people moved away from their homeland, but rather a set of relationship between home and host communities, <clears throat> between the past and present, and between in-group and out-group. <clears throat> I suggest that a peculiar uh, uh, indigenous dias diasporic experience of the feeling alienated in host society, an experience of becoming foreigners in their home, in their own homelands, distinguishes indigenous diasporas from other types of diasporas. This kind of experience resulted from settler encroachments, but not from the exile. The song Homesick by the Bino Yumayang musician Baudu aptly illustrates the feeling of the becoming foreigners in their homeland. Its lyrics can be translated as follows. Homesickness, it overwhelms you only after leaving home, doesn't it? Now I'm still in my home village. Why am I in such a state of distress? It is because my father told me that originally this land was ours. This song reflects the predicament that resulted from the fact that Baudou and his fellow villagers have been deprived of their ancestral lands since the imposition of the modern economic system in indigenous society by the government of the Republic of China in the mid-1950s, a considerable portion of Taiwanese indigenous lands has been purchased by Han settlers, and the lands of the Baudu's village are no exception. In Baudu's village, Han settlers today outnumber indigenous residents 
The government restricts the indigenous villagers' right to hunt and once inhibited them from conducting rituals for a couple of decades. Their Han neighbors often complain about the noise they make during their singing gatherings. The frustration, inconvenience, and embarrassment caused by government interference and the Han neighbors' in annoyance at indigenous lifestyles make the indigenous villagers feel alienated as if living in diaspora on their ancestral land. This indigenous diaspora experience provoked a challenge to conventional definition of diaspora. Conventionally, people think of the spatial distance as the basic definer of diaspora, as this figure shows. The concept of diaspora I formulate as chronotop in Buckton's terms, which allows me to locate the diaspora in times, places, and bodies, inspires me to propose including temporal distance as a definer of diaspora and considering indigenous diaspora as mobile bodies moving um, among the different times and places. By temporal distance, I mean not only the distance between the past and the present, but also a form of distance caused by the denial of a coevalness to indigenous people. Because of the denial of the coevalness, settlers often consider that indigenous people who are living in, quote from Philip Bowman, the word of the past that is frozen at great distance from the present can only either remain indigenous by staying in the past or assimilate into modern society and become non-indigenous. However, the reality is that indigenous peoples are living in the contemporary world and they can still connect themselves to their indigenous past. The basic concept of the, my theory per homing is to consider home as an quote unquote, an imagined virtual community linked through performance. And both home and performance are matrices of quote unquote, known experiences and intimate social relations. As Robin Cohen proposed in his book, Global Diasporas, 2008. Adopting Bakhtin's concept, Tor Travano Lind knows that the chronotype, quote unquote, locates performance in time, place, and the body. And the quote, chronotopes are not only about particular times, place, and individual characters, but also about values, meaning, and judgments related to them, end quote. Follow this theoretical thread, I argue that performance can serve as a chronotopic homing, for it links a virtual home and a set of values, meaning, judgments related to home. By taking the musical revival and restoration of the age set system in the music event Samimusimu of the Baburu village as an example, I will elaborate and examine my performing theory later. Baburu villagers have the debate whether to build a boy's house for years but have yet to reach a consensus. Considering the, that the children without the boys' house did not have the opportunities to participate in village rituals and to wear the traditional regalian, a couple of the Papuru female the villagers established the performing group Lexi in 1998. The founders called about 20 children, including boys and girls of the village together in 1997 and told them the traditional songs and dances. Most of the traditional songs and dances told in legacy was drawn from the repertoire of the Nanwan Boys' House. 
Legacy made their debut on New Year's New Year Day 1998 and performed within and without the Babalu village thereafter. Following the, the framework of the Alabagai of the Nang Wan Boys House and that of the singing Christmas carols, instructor of the Legacy designed the door to door singing event Samimusimu. The term Samimusimu means frolic, joke. In particular, it refers to the frolicking of Buyumat boys when they pass through the back doors of houses in the village after the Alabaga in order to repair, repair or remove misfortune. In the Samimusimu, the uh, Baburu children visit houses both inside and beyond the village. The Samimusimu lasts two days. Um, one day, uh, the children worked through the village, and on the second day, the adults were drive then to house outside of the their village. As one of the founder points out, the Samimusimu allows each Baburu child to have an invisible boy's house in his or her mind. By translating the culture of the Binuyu Mayan tra uh, traditional boy's house into a contemporary version, Baburu villagers restore the age set system a fundamental basis of their social structure and this makes they feel that they have to return to their uh, the time in which their ancestors lived in their home village this figure shows a virtual a virtual return becomes possible through performance as the pattern of the figures shows, the interplay among time, place, and body in the performance forms a complex spiral of relationships in which temporal relationships, human relationships, and spatial relationships interrelate. This spiral of relationships helps to establish a set of the values, meaning, and judgment that define the individual's family and village which can serve as a definer of home. In such a performance, participants can feel being honed through music and dancing to repeat, restore, and remake norms related to the definer of home. Thank you. Quick way. <laughs> I'm Scott Simon Hangamu Wadis Wadan Hangan Turugo. I recognize that I was born in uh, Kikionga, the political center of the Miami people. I uh, now live on unceded territory of the Algonquins. And today we're meeting here on Coast Salish land. I thank all of the ancestors, indigenous and otherwise, who made it possible for us to be here who protected the lands and protected the animal and plant life and brought us together. I also recognize that there are not seven generations of ancestors only, but also seven generations of descendants yet to come that we should be thinking about. Today, I'll be talking about my, my research in Taiwan, um, but it's also in a way, a, a way of introducing the book that's about to come out. It's in production at the University of Toronto Press. It's called, Truly human, that means that Sedek Balai is, a, is the same thing. It means truly human. Indigenous resurgence and indig indigeneity and indigenous resurgence on Formosa. And so in this book, I divided it into the five different essays, um, each based on a, a Sedek Durugu concept. Um, there's Samat, which is the wild animals. There's Magaya, which is... Uh, Gaia is the root, and that's really what the talk today is about. It's the sacred law or ancestral law, but Magaya is the implementation of the law through the rituals um, that in, in the literature often called headhunting. And then Uduk, the spirits from the traditional religion to conversion to Christianity. Lunglungan, the heart, is the seat of ethical reflection. And then Dominun, 
um, but especially in terms of the um, uh, uh, of the weaving together the stories of the past, the minun gari rudan sibio, and. So today I'll talk about Gaia, but one of the things that's interesting about law is the question of sovereignty. I'm going to talk, kind of focus today a bit on that. And it seems that as everybody is talking about sovereignty, and we've had all these political panels here talking about sovereignty, and just to, some stories that people tell. Um, so for example, on January 2nd, 2019, um, in his speech to the compatriots of Taiwan, uh, the Secretary General and Chairman Xi Jinping of China said, All, quote, although our two sides have yet to be reunified, the sovereignty and territory of China has never been severed, and the fact that the mainland and Taiwan belong to one and the same China has never changed, unquote. Now, President Tsai Ing-wen in Taiwan has never failed to reject that story. And so just to give one of many examples, on National Day on October 10th, 2021, she said, quote, the path that China has laid out offers neither a free and democratic way of life for Taiwan nor sovereignty for our 23 million people. Now, this is not just an issue between the Taiwanese government and the Chinese government. It's an issue of, of sovereignty that different peoples think of in different ways. And so I'm going to focus a little bit more on the indigenous. And after Xi's speech, the Indigenous Historical Justice and Transitional Justice Committee in Taipei released a statement saying, quote, we, the indigenous peoples of Taiwan, have pushed this nation forward toward respect for human rights, democracy, and freedom. After thousands of years, we are still here. We have never given up our rightful claim to the sovereignty of Taiwan, unquote. Everybody's talking about sovereignty. It's the same word in Chinese. It's always Zutran. It's always sovereignty in English. But if we listen carefully to all of those stories, they're talking about rather different things. So for Xi, sovereignty is an element of statehood. It's exclusive. It's indivisible. It's something that belongs to a very essentialized China throughout time and space that everybody has to be a part of, and it's indivisible. Um, for, for Tsai, Sovereignty resides in the people as their right to determine their own fate as citizens of a democratic country. Um, as for the indigenous statement, it refers to the notion of, of natural sovereignty. Um, it's an intellectual current in the international indigenous rights movement that sees sovereignty for people who lived without states and without citizens-based democracies for millennia as being unextinguished by colonization by states. And so I want to take a few moments to think about what sovereignty is about as a part of Gaia. Um, I think that one of the ways we can look at that is by thinking about how different notions of sovereignty might be related to different ontologies. And we've got this ontological turn now in anthropology, so that's, that's quite relevant. Um, one of the Leaders of the uh, ontological movement, uh, Philippe Descola, the French anthropologist, um, had an interesting way of reflecting on the differences between, what he calls it naturalism and, and animism, and he's got four ontologies, but he, he worked with the Achuar, uh, and indigenous people in the, in the Amazon, and he says, I shared with joy the life of the Achuar, but I would never have passed my life in a society that at the time was agitated by a permanent vendetta. Every ontology has its disagreeable side, the difference is that the Ashwar didn't impose theirs on the rest of the planet, unquote. And I think that, and this is just an intuition, there might be an idea that these ontologies that people come up with are also related to the politics that people come up with. And one of them would be what we call in our modern world Westphalian sovereignty, uh, which is basically the system that's been imposed uh, much on the rest of the world. So in the book, I, I talk about this in the sense of political ontology. That's a sense that Mario Blazer has brought to this and looking at different worldings um, and how um, there are conflicts that ensue as different worlds or ontologies uh, mingle and conflict with one another. And so we're going to, in the book, I, I take a good look at that. But just looking at Westphalian sovereignty, it's this idea that the state is the final authority um, it's always about territoriality, which is exclusive. The state has the monopoly on the legitimate use of force. 
Um, there's the idea of the, of the nation somehow that has to be created as organic belonging to the nation. And then the notion of um, external legal recognition. And you know, a number of political scientists have pointed out from, I, I said, a, a Chinese political scientist and uh, Jeremy Paltel up in Ottawa, who says that Westphalian sovereignty owes nothing to Chinese tradition and is a purely Western invention. And so the, the, the Chinese political scientist Pan Changxin notes that the problem is that both mainland China and Taiwan converge on acceptance of Westphalian sovereignty. But others have noted that there are other forms of sovereignty that still coexist with that. Um, I think there are really good books in Taiwan anthropology dealing with sovereignty. Uh, Sarah Friedman, Jeffrey Martin talks about how the different notions, Taiwan is at the confluence of uh, the old Qing traditions and um, things that happened because of the Japanese period. And he plays around with that word Zutra and sovereignty, talking about it as host power. And that's something that I've seen Durugu bring up at protests as well, saying, saying to the Taroko National Park, we are the hosts here and you are the guests. So they, they bring that in there. So I, I, I do talk about that and um, in, in the book. In fact, I think that we can even look at incidents such as the Wusha incident of 1930 as an example of violence that comes when there are different political ontologies in, in contest. And I, I never forget that the, uh, the Japanese summarized what they saw um, in the Atayalic groups would be the, the today uh, the Sedek and Durugu that, that um, like Kojima said that the Atayalic society is certainly egalitarian, autonomous, and republic, and if one could call it a political system, one could say that it is an unparalleled democratic system. And so, unquote. And so, I think what we can do when we look at um, these different groups. Um, in indigenous groups in Taiwan, indigenous peoples, indigenous nations, that we can start to unpack their political philosophy. There's a whole body of literature being written now by um, scholars, uh, local scholars, uh, such as um, Dagi Spawan, San Mingren, um, et cetera, but also from people that we meet um, doing anthropological fieldwork, and I've been doing that for 20 years. But the um, the Zedic nations are organized around the Gaia, um, usually translated as law, um, it's a way of thinking about relations between people, between groups, between the living and the dead, even with animals. Um, sometimes they talk about Gaia in very interesting ways. Uh, so uh, once when I talked to an elder about Gaia, he said, I'll tell you about Gaia. And he said, let me tell you about a little bird called Shishil. And he started telling me the story about the, the Shishil, which is, we anthropologists like to say it's a divinatory bird, but it's they say that when they walk up a path to go hunting, if the bird flocks on the left side, uh, it's a bad sign. On the right hand side, it's a good side. If it agitatedly flies in front of them, it's a very bad sign. They go back in the village. And but I, I think that there are many ways to look at that. And it's very interesting that the Shishil became the national symbol as the Duruku got their name rectification in 2004, and then also for the SEDEC in 2008. So they see themselves as the people of the Shishil. And just as some of the indigenous peoples in Canada are looking at animals as political models, I think that the Shishil, in a way, is, is can be seen that way. Um, that it's a, it's a flock of small birds, um, and they often have other ones that come with them. So they bring that and they move through the forest. And in many ways, it's like the, the very flexible, small alang, um, the, the kin-based group that was the basis of political organization in, in pre-colonial times. Um, I, in fact, you know, when I talk to people about politics, they, I would ask them, how do you say state in, in, your, in your language? And people would think for a while and then say, go ga which is actually from Koka, from the Japanese. Um, and so there really was no word. Even the word for, for leader, it was very difficult for people to come up with the word for a political leader, the one that everybody has to follow. Um, in the Drugu constitution that they wrote, they came up with Bukung. Um, but then I, I traced that back, talking to people that actually comes from the word, uh, from the Fukun so, the, the Bukong show in the Japanese period, because the, the government official that gave orders was the person you listened to. So anyway, 
Uh, a lot of them said that I think a lot of them wanted me to say that the word for leader is kapusuran, which is an elder brother or sister, an elder sibling. So there's a very interesting uh, political philosophy of equality between small communities. Um, and then there's the whole question of territory. Um, and, you know, the Japanese, when, when they came, they used the military to conquer these communities and they had rituals. Um, that they called kijun, submission. And the police translated that into the Sedek language as senegul, which is actually the word that probably the people helped the Japanese translate that. It means to follow somebody like you would follow an experienced hunter through the forest. Um, and so they, they do have a very, a, a very interesting political philosophy there under Gaia. And so I think it's important to really reflect on that as an ontological equivalent to what the Westphalian system. And there are lots of ways to think about that. Um, when I was uh, doing my field work um, in the more recent period, when I was looking more at the human-animal relations, I spent some time with an elderly hunter and trapper up in the in the in the in, in the a mountainous part of the uh, Taroko National Park. Um, and was very interested to see the way that everybody knows which group controls which territory. And he goes through and he cuts the paths through the forest that make it possible for him to do his trapping and actually puts a little sign up that says, don't come in here. And But then he makes deals with the younger men so that they can use the same paths um, at night with uh, lamps on their heads so they can get some flying squirrels. And so they've got ways of dealing with the territory and when they were you know trying to figure out some way to create an autonomous zone which i think many groups still want the often the critique of the government we say well you may all take a inside you don't have the, the talent to do that and of course they have the talent to do that and so i think it's a, a very positive sign that now there are some movements towards self-management of hunting territories um but i think this uh way of looking at political ontologies and of looking at ways of relating to issues of sovereignty and of ways of managing land and the relationality with other animals as not necessarily exclusive to indigenous peoples, those who have got the political status of indigenous peoples. And so I kind of like to develop some of these ideas later after the, this book. Um, but I looked at some other examples of that. And one of them is uh, one of the one of my main informants in the Durugu territory. He once took me to the fishing association um, in Hualien. And at that point, it was Mai Ying-jo's governance, and they were signing an agreement about, about uh, fishing. And so I went and talked to them, and, and uh, the fishing association told me the story about how um, the Taiwanese fishers and the uh, Okinawan ones Actually, they, they follow the currents in different ways because they're coming from different directions and they are going after different kinds of fish. Um, and he said, and I quote him here, we manage this by ourselves very well for generations. The conflicts only began when states starting to get involved. And so I think a lot of different local people in very precise and intimate intergenerational relationships with different species, they have ways of managing those relations that predate um, notions of Westphalian sovereignty. And so I think, you know, and that's the hunting, it's, it's, it's uh, with the mammals. I think there have been some interesting cases of more uh, of recent ones of um, ornithologists collaborating on the protection of terns, the Chinese crested tern, the greater crested terns in the Matsu Islands and nearby islands across the cross-strait relationships have, have happened. Um, China's gotten a bit more ferocious about those things with their wolf diplomacy. And they basically, uh, in 2020, they uh, got BirdLife International to kick the Taiwan Wild Bird Federation out of BirdLife. And and so things are going in, in probably the, the wrong direction there. But I think that looking at indigenous political philosophies, as I've done, it gives us a new way to think about some of these issues. And... They are our contemporaries. It's, they're not ethnographic ex exhibits in a museum somewhere. So I think that they're important leaders. And these discourses about sovereignty, 
Um, they make claims about what exists in the world. Does Taiwan exist? Does Tikal Tzedek exist? You know, and so those are very important ontological issues. Um, I think that as I come to a conclusion here, um, some of the things in anthropology are very uh, are, are very favorable to these things. Um, our, and Tim Ingold, for example, anthropologist much influenced by uh, Heidegger, um, he tries to envision new ways of imagining and living in the world other than what he calls the sovereign purview of trying to look at the world from above and control it. And he says, looking for a dismantling of the system, he says, quote, the first step in doing so is to think of humans and indeed of creatures of all other kinds in terms not of what they are, but of what they do. To think of ourselves not as beings, but as becomings, that is not as discrete and preformed entities, but as trajectories of movement and growth, unquote. So I think if we're to learn from indigenous knowledge and from indigenous ontologies from around the world, um, actually in my book, I bring together the philosophies of uh, the Zedek with some from Canadian First Nations. I think that we would need to really shift our focus from a study of territorial sovereignty. So always thinking about drawing boundaries on a map somehow. And that's always related somehow to extraction of, of resources. But instead we need to relativize as anthropologists that one particular ontology to relify and televise the Westphalian system to show there are other ways of imagining the world. And many of those other ontologies and the ones I'm looking at here, they emphasize relationships. And relationships are very important, including those with non-humans. Learning from indigenous peoples is so important. And that's what I think this land acknowledgement that I did is about, that we need to acknowledge how we are related to people around us and how that's grounded in history and in relations. Um, and especially nowadays, this is very important. And the indigenous elders bring this up, but so do people like Philippe Descola and Tim Ingold. We're living in a historically unprecedented era in which humans have the ability to destroy the planet. And in fact, we're doing so. I think that some of the things that we see every day, including this hot weather yesterday, are, are signs of that. Um, and so I think that the uh, indigenous ontologies, including Gaia, they provide countervailing tendencies, what Carl Polanyi once called counter movements. And this is true of Taiwan, and it's true, it's true on Formosa, and it's true here on Turtle Island. So I think that we ignore these traditional teachings of indigenous peoples and their ideas for the contemporary world at our own peril. And so I hope that we can learn to walk better with one another. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, The presenter's wonderful presentation. Uh, may I invite uh, our uh, in-person presenter, maybe sitting in the front, and uh, we will have about twenty minutes for Q and A. Yeah. Yes, Professor Lavi. Yes, please. Hello, Dr. Tsai, I uh, appreciate your report very much. It's very, very interesting. Uh, but I just wanted to ask you a, a clarification question. On, in the can article, you speak louder? I yeah. cannot hear you avoid. OK, can you hear me now? Yeah. OK. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, so Dr. Tsai, I really enjoyed your article. I think it's uh, very, very useful and interesting. Uh, but I have a question of clarification about the research that shows that 85% of Taiwanese have some uh, indigenous blood. Um, what's the base population? Is How do you define Taiwanese? Is that the population of Taiwan at this time, or are you further differentiating among that population to call them Taiwanese? Okay. I need to answer the question right now. It would be oh, nice. 
<laughs> the chair, I need to uh, answer the question right now, or you have to collect the other question. Uh, I think I think we can uh, do the independent Q and A. So please answer right now. Yeah, and then we can take another question. Okay. Uh, it actually it very interesting. Um, the Maryland research finding from thirteen percent to twenty six percent to eighty five percent. Um, the population is related to all the Taiwanese, but um. In my article, I show that if you use different technology, it will lead to the different scientific finding. So 30% is based on Y chromosome and 26% is based on uh, mitochondrial DNA analysis and 85% it combines three technology, Y chromosome and uh, mitochondrial DNA and the HLA. So, Dr. Tsai, uh, actually, my question is much more simple minded uh, than you are assuming. I'm really just asking is the when you say Taiwanese, Taiwanese, do you mean the population of Taiwan, the entire population of Taiwan? And if that's true, then, uh, you know, are the kind of uh, population that we used to call or sometimes call Weishengren, are that, is that the 15% that is not, uh, doesn't uh, have this uh, indigenous uh, blood, uh, or uh, is there some differentiation among a different population? If you could just speak to the definition of Taiwanese, that's what I want. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um Based on Mary Lin research finding, she collects Taiwanese sample is from four great ethnic groups, including Melanda, Hokolo, Haga, and the indigenous people. I see. Thank you. So I think that's it. Uh, thank you, Bill. And do we have any questions? Yes, please. If you can come up, because we are streaming. Yes. Uh, so this is a question for Professor Chen. Uh, so I'm uh, really interested in the relationship between the interiority that you describe for these um, boys who are doing the dancing and singing and the, the function it's supposed to serve um, in terms of creating a sense of home and the image of the boys village in or the boys home house in their in their minds. Um, and then the, the sort of exterior, the, the performative function, right? So the per, per Homing has the performative function. You didn't really talk very much about the performance. We saw it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was wondering if you could talk about sort of the audience, um, the different audiences for this, um, and the, the relationship between the performance and the interior function that it's serving. Thank you. OK. Uh, I think this is a great question because I, I I didn't have time to talk about the audiences and I I think the the, the response of the audience is very important in this kind of uh, interactions and 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 like this kind of interaction actually make uh, the uh, kind of the um, Imagine the virtual uh, home then uh, meaningful. Um, as I said, that actually I, I I just cut a section of my my presentation uh, because the time uh, constraint uh, constraint. So actually, that part I cut uh, uh, is something about the response from the audience. Um, uh, as I said, that they uh, perform not only uh, in the village, but uh, outside the village, and they do not uh, uh, just uh, uh, perform for the indigenous uh, families, but also for non-indigenous families. 
Um, so when they uh, visit non-indigenous families, they they usually uh, sing um, non-indigenous songs like Mandarin song and sometimes even uh, Taiyu ge or, 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 or Japanese song. And so uh, in this way, um, we, we can see that there is some uh, hybridity here, and they and that we can uh, even uh, use the term double consciousness here because uh, the the members of uh, legacy they they not only feel that they are indigenous, but they feel that they are living in the contemporary world. And, and so I think uh, the audience's uh, response is very important to, uh, for them to connect um, their, their present and, and, and their past and con uh, connecting um, in-group and out-group Okay, um, did I answer to your question? Okay, thank you. Yes, please. Thank you for the wonderful uh, presentation. And I have a question for Professor uh, Scott Simon. Uh, first of all, thank you for the beautiful prayer in the beginning. And um, my question is um, sort of also a question uh, when, I, when I do my writing and research. So I'm wondering when you talk about sovereignty, um, instead of like talking about the indigenous um, wisdom or like, you're kind of um, taking a route la like that, talking about indigenous wisdom. And but I'm wondering if, like, if we're talking about uh, like Yuan Zhang Hui, the indigenous trans, uh, how, what's the English indigenous uh, transitional justice, when we're doing a job to territorialize the indigenous people's place or space, uh, how do you negotiate uh, this concept? when we have to encounter the nation state in the political sense. Yes, thank you. Uh, I think that's a really important question and it's something that they're working on right now. Uh, so it's something that's in becoming rather than something that's already been done. Um, but it, it's been a real issue that there's simultaneously a nationalist imagination of 16 different indigenous peoples like the Taidu Ketsu, Saide Ketsu, Ameitsu, right? And then I think that in each one of those peoples there are different dynamics going on. Um, but there, there was a goal at one time of having all of those become an indigenous self governing area. I think that what's happened now is it's going towards the the Bulo Ihue. The, and then each of those groups has the right to determine their own borders. And then there'll be discussions from that. Um, but even there, there's been a lot of discussion at the local area. Um, so for example, I was there at one meeting uh, when they had a very lively discussion about whether it's appropriate to use Fu Shi Chun as the basis of a Bulo Iwe tribal council, and or if they should have the five different Alang that constitute that village, which is a state creation. And after a long debate, which was very emotional, they decided to use the the, the village that the state created. And so I think that there's a lot of worlding projects going on. And it includes the state and its imagination and includes very local people with their imaginations. And it's still something that is in negotiation and I don't think it's gonna be settled soon. So you identified a very important issue there. <laughs> Uh, 
I have a question to. Oh, sorry. So I have a question to uh, Professor Chen. <clears throat> and in your PowerPoint, there's a um, term which is quite simple but quite attractive for me, which is bodies. So in your um, uh, diagram to explain uh, the idea of cor chronotope. Yeah. So uh, my question is, since I'm in the field of comparative literature, but um, this is really idea uh, for me quite important in literature. But I'm wondering, and it's more about my curiosity than the question. Um, uh, what's the meaning of bodies in this study uh, in particular? Uh, is it a component or it's is it a vehicle? I don't know. Uh, in this diagram with uh, time, place, and bodies to form this um, pros uh, uh, per, per homing process. And the second question is, no, the um, the sub-question is, um, so bodies, um, we can say it's as a vi physical agency, but in uh, in the um, in the field of uh, anthropology, does bodies have also a cultural, uh, has uh, have also a cultural or even meth uh, metaphysical meanings? Yeah. So, so in general, I'm wondering about <laughs> these ideas of bodies. Yeah. Thank you a lot. Oh, uh, thank you for this. Uh, actually. One question, two question. Okay, <laughs> one question now, two question is okay. Oh. Um, I, I think um, if I uh, can answer this question uh, uh, in uh, sufficiently, I should say that um, it. I I I, I should say that it, this kind of a performing uh, theory actually is uh, is a part of a theory I'm developing. And so if I uh, want to uh, uh, elaborate uh, my ideas about a uh, body, I, I think I should uh, briefly explain about my, my big project. Um, now I'm developing uh, a theory involving uh, time, space, and body. And so we can uh, imagine that uh, there are three uh, dimensions, and you can imagine uh, like uh, time is, uh, uh, you can imagine time as different layers of uh, something. Uh, and and then uh, the other uh, dimension is time, and body is another uh, is another dimension. And as you asking, uh, is body meaning uh, the the meaning of the body is uh, physically is about physical uh, entity or. Um, or it, it has uh, met, uh, uh, metaphor, metaphorical meaning. I think it, it's both. Um, because what I uh, mean body here in my in my model, uh, it refers to uh, somebody, uh, some person, but it also related to uh what this uh person want to perform want to uh or, or, or the way uh this person uh, perceives sound and different uh senses like uh like uh smell like like uh like watching like this and so this make my um my framework very complex, uh, so I consider that a uh, musical event is something that uh, uh, we can consider uh, uh, an intersection of three dimensions, body, uh, time, and, uh, and, and place. 
and sp or space. And so if you uh, connect this intersection with other connection, then uh, you can uh, trace the trajectory uh, tra uh, trajectories of uh, someone's musical uh, experience, but everyone has is uh, has have his or her own way to perform or uh, or perceive this kind of uh, a journey or pathways. So everyone uh, will have his own. Uh, explanation of of their um, musical experience. And so in terms of indigeneity, uh, there are different kinds of indigeneity in the process of listening, performing, and uh, perceiving. So I think this uh, motto, uh, I would like to develop it uh, to, uh, I have a, an, an, a goal that this model not only uh, can be used in, uh, in the analysis of the indigenous music or indigenous identity, I, it, it actually can be used in different kinds of music or different kinds of um, expressive arts. Yeah, so, uh, so I, I, I wish, I wish I can uh, make it simpler. But but if I just say that, uh, yeah, it's physical and it, it's met, met, metaphorical. I, I think um, it cannot answer to uh, it cannot answer to your questions. So I make it much complex, and I hope I I I, I answered to your question. Thank you. Uh, since we have kind of a uh, technical issue in the middle of the session, I think we, we can take one last question, if there's any. Yes, please. Thanks for all of your presentation. Uh, I'm interested in the indigenous literature. May I ask the score? Uh, um, uh, how how can I connect your research to the uh, is, uh, especially the time that indigenous uh, the concept of indigenous they have different perspective of time and place and I read so many indigenous literature they describe so many uh, interesting story so but. May you give me more uh, example? How can I uh, cite your paper, <laughs> your book? It, uh, it's not just literature, it's culture and so many fields that I, I can learn from you. Thank you. That's a, I think that's more of a, a nice comment. So, because literature, what is literature, of course, you know, and I think that some of the, um, there are people, the authors, you know, that are working on the right short stories that we know about as literature. Um, and there are others like uh, Sun Mingran who write more like essays, but that's, that's, that's a form of literature too. Or uh, Dagi Spawan who writes, He's made he's had several volumes coming out of Sedek Balai, the, the movie, you know, and his response to that. And these are all ways of story, of telling stories and and worlding practices. And I, I hope that the work that I do also is that when I go and talk to people and collect some stories and listen to legends and, and so forth and put them together. But yeah, I think we can all contribute to this by telling stories and repeating stories that we hear and trying to learn from them. So I thank you very much for your interest in the book, which will come out in the fall. So thank you. Alrighty, so it's time. And uh, I think we should wrap up uh, this session. And uh, thank you all for coming. And uh, we have wonderful presentation and the wonderful questions. I think this is really, really fruitful uh, session.